Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the future of AI and human capital, a live interactive event between Fourth Brain and Andrew Ung's AI Fund. Backed by the AI Fund Venture Studio, Fourth Brain helps you take your ML career to the next level. Our cohort-based courses in machine learning engineering and machine learning operations help you build your AI portfolio with a supportive community so that you can make a bigger impact wherever you go next in your future ML career journey. Speaking of future ML careers, our speaker today knows all too well how challenging it is for companies to find talented AI and ML practitioners to solve really tough problems at the intersection of technology and real business value. Before we meet our speaker, let's meet each other as always. Our small but mighty fourth brain community is global and you never know who you might meet in the YouTube live chat today. So let's go ahead and drop a little bit about ourselves into the chat. Uh, and I'll go ahead and start first to share. I'm Greg and I'm the director of product and curriculum at fourth brain. I live in San Francisco. So tell us a little bit about yourself in the chat right now. And let's keep the intros coming as we learn a little bit more about what we're gonna take from today's event. Today, we're gonna to introduce the venture studio behind Fourth Brain, the AI Fund. AI Fund companies include DeepLearning.ai, Landing AI, WorkEra, and many more startup companies. With a handful of companies working at the intersection of AI and education, the fund has an incredibly rich perspective on the growing AI talent pool and market for talent. If you're betting on AI being great for your career, so are we, and so is the AI Fund. Today, we'll dig into the details, including importantly, what all this means for you, the learner in 2022. After today's session, you'll understand how Andrew Ung's fund thinks about the future of AI and human capital. And of course, there'll be lots of times time for questions. First, we'll hear from our speaker who will be presenting some important context about the AI fund before talking about the growing need for AI talent in the market. He'll also provide us with a unique look into the investor perspective, doing a deep dive on what all this means for you afterwards. Following the presentation, I'll ask a few questions. And then we'll open it up for Q&A from all of you. So if you see anything that piques your interest, please drop your questions directly in the YouTube live chat and I'll shout you out and make sure that we get an answer for you. With that, I'm thrilled to give a warm welcome to Ryan Cunningham. As a builder at AI Fund, Ryan evaluates, incubates, and stands up new AI companies with stellar entrepreneurs. His hands-on approach involves product strategy, economic analyses, and developing functional ML prototypes on top of broader research and due diligence. Prior to joining AI Fund, Ryan worked in product at Uber for four years across delivery, aerial ride sharing, and micro mobility applications. In addition to his BS in finance and economics from Georgetown, Ryan is also pursuing a graduate certificate in AI from Stanford. His focus areas include AI infrastructure, human capital, ML ops, and autonomous vehicles, among many others. Ryan, we're so excited to have you here today. Let's go ahead and take it away. Greg, thank you very much for having me as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today and with the hundreds of interested learners uh, who are also tuning in. Uh, I've been in the same shoes as many of you uh, before, many times over. Uh, investigating how secondary education can help fulfill my own personal and professional goals, especially with an AI ML. And it makes me really, really happy uh, to be on the other side of that now, sharing a little bit about my story and uh, my perspectives. I'm gonna share my screen here uh, because I have a few slides that I'd like to, uh, that I'd like to walk through. Uh, so Greg, let me know if, uh, if we can see everything correctly here. One second. Are you looking good? Wonderful. Uh, now, I've been asked uh, by the team to share a little bit about myself before jumping into the main content. Uh, but as for the agenda, I've broken up the presentation into, uh, into five parts about me, what is AI Fund, the future of human capital, 
the marketplace problem, and fourth brain's advantage. Each of these has a distinct takeaway that if it's the only thing people remember from this presentation, I really hope that you find helpful to inform your learning journey within this exciting field. So a little about me. Today, I work for Andrew Ng at his venture studio, AI Fund, which Greg had introduced a moment ago. And in my work there, I evaluate, incubate, build, and advise new AI companies with a stellar team of entrepreneurs that we work with. Salah Muhammad, Fourth Brain's co-founder and CEO, is one such entrepreneur, as well as the rest of her team, including Matt and Greg. Prior to that, I worked at Uber for four years before uh, leaving to lead AI product management at an NLP startup called Spike Trap. Developing products for food delivery, drones, aerial ride sharing, and more alongside the data science and AI teams was my introduction to what would later formalize into the field of ML ops. Before that, I started my career as a technology investment banker at Credit Suisse. Now, that's the streamlined version. And I, I smile a bit here because I know that whenever I introduce myself that way, it gives a very clean, very linear image of how my career has gone from one place to the next. The truth is it's anything but linear. I've taken a lot of twists and turns in my path as I'm sure many of you have and will continue to do as well. Um, but learning has been a consistent through line for all of that. Every, uh, every step on that journey has been, uh, has been either the product of or the pursuit of uh, learnings that would help me further down the way, even if it wasn't clear at the time. Now, the earliest and perhaps most important example of this would be back in 2011, when a group of Stanford professors took the first step in what would revolutionize the world of online education. Many of you, I'm sure, already know what I'm talking about. In August of 2011, the Stanford School of Engineering released a set of interactive courses via YouTube that hundreds of thousands of learners all over the world enrolled in. While I was studying finance and economics at Georgetown, I took two of these CompSite courses. Introduction to AI with Sebastian Thrun, who would later go on to co-found Udacity, and Machine Learning with Andrew Ng, who would later co-found Coursera, and who, unbeknownst to me, I would become fortunate enough uh, to work for and learn from directly in 10 years time. Though I wasn't sure how a uh, familiarity with artificial intelligence would help me in my immediate professional future, because I was very much going down the investment banking path, uh, I was genuinely interested in the field as an amateur programmer and an avid consumer of science fiction. This effectively planted a seed of interest in the field that would blossom over time as my career would shift from finance to product, to data science, to AI products, and now to AI company building. I was always curious how to integrate the latest advancements in modeling techniques or new algorithms to solve hard problems, no matter where I was working. I knew that eventually the rest of the world would catch up as models became more efficient, compute became more accessible, and people's familiarity with the subject would cross the threshold needed for mainstream adoption. The learning bug, of course, doesn't stop with a diploma. It, later in my career, I was voraciously consuming any material that I could find that would encourage me to be a better AI product manager, to better spot opportunities that would warrant the use of applied AI, and how to structure product or project proposals in a way that MLEs and data scientists would find most useful. And to that end, uh, I pride myself on being a much more hands-on technical PM when working with my ENG and DS counterparts. Education is a big part of that. In addition to other domains like strategy and international business, learning has been a consistent and necessary part of my professional and personal life as I, as I'm sure many of you are as well, which is why we're here today, are constantly seeking how to upskill ourselves when new technologies enter the market. Which brings me to my first point. So the first takeaway is that the philosophy that learning is a lifelong commitment to upgrading yourself, that learning is a lifelong commitment to upgrading yourself. Now, what, what's meant by this? Learning, of course, is uh, developing a familiarity with and expertise in new concepts, fields, and technologies. That's pretty straightforward. A new uh, you know, transformer model comes out. You want to learn uh, what that's all about. You want to learn why that is sufficiently different uh, from uh, from, prior, uh, from prior methods that you may have been using for your domain, you want to be on top of that. A lifelong commitment means that this doesn't end with a diploma. 
It ends only if you choose to. You only stop learning by choice. Now, some people get very comfortable uh, with their expertise in a given field. They think, I know everything there is to know about this. The world isn't that different. Uh, my degree is just fine. But uh, as we will later see, uh, the concept of concept drift uh, is very much alive when it comes to our own mental maps of the world. Uh, the world is changing constantly as the past two years has probably demonstrated to many of us. And what we think we may know uh, from just two years ago may already be out of date. So learning is committing ourselves to a lifelong pursuit of ensuring that we are on top of, or at least familiar with, uh, the latest technologies and the latest best practices for using those technologies. And when I talk about upgrading yourself, I mean presenting yourself in a way that allows you to take advantage of and be prepared for new technologies and new applications as they arise, most specifically, such that you are in a much better position compared to any other members of the talent marketplace that may come up. They, they may be newer uh, to the market and thus fresher with, uh, uh, with the newest technologies and the newest concepts, which uh, your you know, years old diploma may no longer apply uh, for as much. But as long as you continue to upgrade yourself, you will stay on top of things, much like any other machine learning model. Of course, your performance is gonna decay over time, like any other learning model, unless you continue to retrain it with new production data, with new things as they emerge. Very easy to understand, very straightforward. Now, let's go back to AI Fund. We were talking about this a little bit. AI Fund is the venture studio, of course, uh, that, had, uh, that had incubated and co-built Fourth Brain alongside Salva, who I mentioned earlier. So who are we, really? Now, I mentioned that AI Fund is a venture studio that's very specific, not a venture capital fund, but a venture studio that strives to move humanity forward by accelerating the adoption of AI. When I say that we are a studio, I mean that we prefer to build companies rather than strictly invest in them. We prefer to uh, ideate on some of the uh, largest problems that we can imagine that would warrant a creative application of machine learning in order to solve the problem. Perhaps there's a low hanging fruit that nobody had actually considered. Uh, and then uh, go out to actually acquire or, or recruit uh, the right founders to help us build this thing in partnership. Then we build it and then we fund it. In doing so, we have much greater uh, creative control uh, over the progression of the idea. Uh, and uh, founders are much happier to actually work with us because we've conducted a lot of the diligence, a lot of the validation, and a lot of the technical feasibility assessments that most founders uh, will spend months or even years trying to accomplish before they hit go. So that's how a venture studio model works, uh, at least for us. This is a relatively new concept within venture. So keep this in mind as others begin to emerge. But I also wanted to hover on uh, our mission, what we had said a second ago, accelerating the adoption of AI. What does that mean exactly? Accelerating the adoption of AI. Accelerating the adoption of AI means democratizing the access that most people, most customers, most enterprises uh, can actually have when it comes to using artificial intelligence for their intended goals. Unfortunately, there is a uh, survey that is conducted by BCG and MIT every year for the past five years uh, that attempts to uh, see how AI has been adopted uh, in the enterprise market uh, or just by businesses overall, I should say. Um, unfortunately, only 10% of organizations, one out of every 10 have actually achieved significant financial benefits with their AI projects. Now, how could that actually be the case? Um, is it the fact that, you know, is it say the executives uh, perhaps being a little bit, you know, set in their ways. We talked about older mental models before that they don't yet see or understand how to actually uh, use AI to generate business value. That's not true because in the same report, apparently 70% of those surveyed actually understand how AI can generate business value for their enterprise. 59% uh, say they already have an AI strategy and about the same amount who actually have a strategy are piloting or deploying AI as a part of that strategy. So it's certainly not executive buy-in. 
uh, that that's a barrier here. Is it perhaps the technology or the algorithms? That's not the case either. Uh, most off the shelf uh, open source models that you can get through Hugging Face, uh, especially for natural language processing in this example, uh, are worlds better than they were even a year ago. Uh, so that almost anybody would be able to get the ball rolling on an individual project and then use a data centric uh, AI methodology uh, to continue to improve it up to whatever baseline they wanna to get to. So it's not the algorithms, uh, they're doing just fine. It's not the technology, it's more accessible than it's ever been before. So what is the problem? Why is it that only 10% uh, of organizations are actually seeing positive financial ROI? The same report co-authors uh, mentioned that at the center of all of this is the human in the equation, the human capital. It's the ability for humans to actually integrate with these AI systems. And by that, I mean uh, to learn from and improve upon and continuously train uh, these AI systems uh, so that they continue to uh, perform not just at the level that they intend, but to exceed that over time. So there is a lack of familiarity for the most part for this long tail of organizations uh, that their internal human capital actually has uh, with the tools and methodologies required to actually make use of artificial intelligence in the workplace. Now, this may come as a surprise to many of you who read about uh, the amazing advancements uh, that we are seeing at, uh, say, Google, Meta, and others when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, there's been some, you know, uh, some, hot, uh, uh, some hot stories that have gone around as well. Uh, such performance models actually uh, perhaps even uh, mimicking sentience, but discount that considerably. Uh, it just means that now AI has really entered the mainstream uh, in, a very, uh, in a very clear way, but there still lacks enough familiarity with it to actually make uh, use in an applied format in the long tail of organizations. So uh, this is what we mean by investigating the barriers to actually the adoption of AI. We want to remove this barrier in order to accelerate the adoption. So point number two for us, Takeaway number two from AI Fund's perspective is that upgrading human capital is a foundational requirement for the adoption of AI. Upgrading human capital is a foundational requirement for the adoption of AI. If you don't train your workforce to be able to make use of artificial intelligence and deploy those systems and uh, continue to generate positive ROI, you're never gonna actually see, uh, see AI proliferate in the way that you expect it to. Which brings us to the third section, the future of human capital as it relates to artificial intelligence. Human capital is a very broad term, but we're talking today about uh, AI's role in that and AI ML education. Uh, as I see it and as AI Fund sees it, um, really at a very base level, at a very basic level, even a passing familiarity with, uh, with the MLOps framework is going to be a massive uh, bonus to any, uh, to any workforce that doesn't yet understand this. So human capital in order to actually, uh, in order to actually build and develop AI systems needs to be able to at a minimum, train and deploy a model, monitor its performance uh, in production, and then retrain and improve that model with new production data as it's coming in. Okay, very basic MLOps stuff, but there's a key but here. Uh, that's only good up to a certain point. You can, have, uh, you can have this work at a small scale and do just fine, but scaling these models to work not just with one customer, but with 10 customers, a thousand customers, or perhaps a thousand cities in one case, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, is, uh, is a whole other body of work. So it's good to have a passing familiarity here uh, with at least the MLOps framework, but the real key in order to see massive financial ROI is knowing how to scale it. So point number three, the future of human capital as it relates to AI requires increasingly more people who can build, improve and scale AI systems. So we'll talk in a little bit about uh, the talent deficit that exists between the amount of roles that require this and the amount of people graduating uh, from universities uh, with those skills. But uh, another thing to consider is outside of any of that, uh, what we've seen since 
uh, the past two years of COVID has been an increase in the digitization of the workplace as staffing shortages more broadly have impacted businesses' ability to actually satisfy their end customers. So there's broader interest in digitization of services, automation of existing workflows that were otherwise really, really manual, and even investment in uh, robotics um, in uh, certain applications as well, which is increasing the need and the tension for AI ML talent in these workplaces. But most of that talent is concentrated in the organizations that already have most of the access and most of the learnings there. So the future of human capital more broadly for the long tail of organizations is gonna require people who can do exactly that. who can build, improve and scale AI systems. Let's talk a little bit about scale. So once upon a time at Uber Eats uh, and at Uber more broadly, the incentives program, which we had for drivers and couriers uh, was designed to encourage, uh, encourage dri uh, drivers to sign up so we'd have a broader supply base so that our demand was uh, going to be uh, very well supported and we would never have a situation in which we would have an unfulfilled order or an unfulfilled ride. Uh, the way in which we did this was rather manual. The GMs who owned each of their markets uh, would set the earnings goals uh, for their drivers and they, would, uh, and they would design their bonus and incentive system such that uh, for proper utilization of their time, the drivers and couriers would be more than well compensated. So this is a very manual process and it worked pretty well for a while when we were mostly operating within box one, when we were in a world in which it was very much growth at all costs. Okay, many of you have probably already seen Super Pumped on Hulu, which, you know, many Hollywood liberties, but it's a fun show. Uh, growth at all costs, meaning acquire as much drivers as you can, as many couriers as possible, and the market will just absorb it because the growth potential is near infinite. All right, and that, that was our mental model at the time in box one, growth at all costs. Not long after I joined, uh, we had noticed that the world was more starting to resemble box two. We saw that courier supply growth uh, was outpacing demand growth, relatively speaking. So this, was that, this ended up actually diluting per courier earnings. Um, the manual uh, localized incentives process was actually making this worse because uh, people were acting at a federated level and not at a, uh, at a centralized level. Uh, manner in which they could actually optimize an entire portfolio of assets with a single budget. So this was, uh, this was a challenge that had been presented to us. We needed to think of a way in which we could, uh, we could get the marketplace back on track, but do so without breaking the bank. So the task that the Uberese data science team actually uh, had taken on in partnership with product and operations and marketing and a whole cross-functional uh, strike team uh, was to design and implement an algorithmic incentives model, which could one, optimize against the local variables that the GMs, the general managers, knew best, and two, would scale to new geographies, would scale to markets that the model had never seen before, and do so without breaking the bank and without breaking the market. Ultimately, the team had developed uh, a very high-performing incentives model, which optimized supply growth, so the incentives or the sign-up bonuses against uh, either demand, acquisition costs, and utilization goals. Again, there was a deep partnership with product and ops uh, on this. It was not built in a vacuum. And so uh, in order to scale this, we had first started with a handful of markets across all of our regions. We picked just a few cities in order to see uh, if these models were working pretty well in conditions that we uh, consider to be significantly different, different size, different, uh, uh, different you know, expected, uh, 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 different fleet size, market size, et cetera. Uh, once we determined that that was working really well, you know, we retrained the model on some of the new uh, variables that came up uh, or the new uh, distributions that we had seen. And then we scaled it to the entire portfolio of cities that we had, which hundreds at the time, thousands now, uh, this is the same thing that was happening on the ride side as well. They were navigating away from these manual incentives um, and they needed to scale up an algorithmic way. Uh, they needed to scale up a series of machine learning models uh, in order to do this at scale uh, rather than relying on a decentralized network of, um, of GMs in order to do this. So uh, all that is to say that uh, Uber Eats and Uber in general 
uh, very uniquely had a wonderful concentration of some of the most talented machine learning engineers, data scientists, uh, and product managers uh, that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. But this was also in a time well before MLOps was really formalized. Uh, DevOps existed, but there were some distinct differences uh, from MLOps that hadn't been appreciated. We were all still kind of figuring all this stuff out. Fortunately for us, and still one of my favorite parts of having worked at Uber, uh, was their contribution to open source uh, culture and engineering. And uh, much of the work that had gone into building our internal uh, machine learning architecture, such as Michelangelo, ended up uh, formalizing into uh, actual companies uh, that uh, are now selling their products to, uh, to uh, dozens, if not hundreds of other customers so that they can build machine learning models in exactly the same scalable way that we did. So the people who made Michelangelo went on to co-found Tekton. Uh, the folks who worked on uh, Voyager, which was our geospatial imaging uh, program, uh, had gone on to create unfolded.ai. And that was acquired by Foursquare just last year. Uh, so there, feel free to read up on that if you will. But uh, the point is that we had all the folks, uh, we had a huge concentration of folks who knew how to scale this. Um, and we have since gone on to release a lot of uh, the learnings that have gone into uh, how to scale these systems more broadly. And I encourage all of you to go ahead and read up on that in addition to uh, the, uh, the learning journey that you, all, that you are already on. Uber has a ton of resources that will be helpful there. Now, bringing it back to, uh, uh, to section number four, the marketplace problem, okay? Uh, this is really my perspective and AI Fund's perspective as an investor uh, in ed tech, as an investor in human capital. Um, and when I call it a marketplace problem, we were just talking about Uber Eats, uh, I am distinguishing this from thinking about the traditional issues that you know plague uh, that plague education when we look at that as a category instead thinking about this as uh, as a demand for talent and the supply of talent if you think about it objectively like that the problem becomes much easier to solve so as, as a few fast facts the software talent gap is uh, growing every year we're, we're all very aware of this at a global at a global level uh, there's broad staff, uh, staffing issues, lots of deficits, uh, but within skills that require data and engineering as a skill set, according to a report by McKinsey, uh, we're looking at about 17.2 million roles every year, not total, every year that go unfulfilled. 17.2 million roles that are unfulfilled because there is not enough talent that are qualified for those roles to acquire. And that's just today. Well, that's really as of last year, but that is right now contemporary. Uh, that is growing to about double that in 2030, uh, according to these reports. Um, the traditional way in which most companies will try to acquire software engineering or data science talent for these roles is to go after the university systems. Okay, so you may have undergraduates that, uh, that had studied uh, one particular form of engineering but uh, most hiring managers will uh, outright demand, if not request, uh, that you have a master's degree at the bare minimum uh, in one of these advanced fields uh, for, uh, to basically credential yourself to say, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to software engineering or to data science or something equivalent to that. But realistically, there aren't really enough advanced degree holders that are minted every year in order to meet the gap. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other figures in a second, but what's important to point out is that even for the most advanced, um, or not even for the most advanced, for intermediate level, uh, intermediate to senior level AI ML roles, uh, many hiring managers are, uh, say, requesting PhD, nice to have. If not, uh, we demand that you have a PhD in this field. Not really, uh, not really a realistic goal on the parts of these hiring managers. Only there's only a talent pool of maybe 22,000 PhDs in the world uh, that have uh, uh, that have studied artificial intelligence and machine learning, and of only about a quarter of them, estimated by this survey, uh, are actually this uh, those that have the necessary chops uh, to be able to work in the enterprise and bring something to market. Uh, they're probably perfectly happy within academia and research. Uh, but that talent pool is not deep enough uh, to satisfy all the roles uh, that 
the long tail, the 90% of enterprises that we talked about earlier have. And neither, by the way, are the master's degree students either, which number at about 30K a year. So uh, there's a distinct deficit there. In fact, there's a deficit across all those categories. There are not enough university graduates with advanced degrees or even mat or even undergraduate degrees for that matter uh, that are being minted in order to uh, in order to cover this talent gap. This is a huge problem. Today, that problem is worth about twenty three billion dollars annually. In ten years, by twenty thirty, that's expected to ten x to about two hundred and forty eight billion dollars. Going by, of course, you know the average tuition cost of about forty k uh, to train one of these uh, one of these students. Uh, that's really where the figure comes from. So it's growing that dramatically. There's a few things that go into this. This is again, you know, the investor perspective when I think uh, about this marketplace. You know, we need to create talent supply. How do we create talent supply? Well, we educate them. Well, how long will it take to educate them? How long will it take to onboard them effectively? Uh, we're dropping the ball in terms of K through 12 education uh, when it comes to computer science and STEM more broadly. Uh, this is something that we had discovered when we were, uh, when we were co-building uh, one of our recent uh, launches, Kira Learning, uh, which is developing a computer science and STEM curricula for K through 12 market uh, and that Andrew Ng has been very, very involved with. Uh, but apparently 20% uh, of countries actually mandate CS education, but only 7% actually offer it. And the United States is no exception. At the state level, 39 states and growing are mandating uh, CS as a core requirement, but not all of them actually have a curriculum that they can use to teach. They don't have the standards because they haven't agreed upon what the standards should be because they don't know. So most curricula that they have, which are provided by you know, Pearson and others are at least a decade out of date. This was made abundantly clear to me when I found out that most high school students were doing the same capstone project that I had taken 15 years ago when I was learning computer science for the first time, designing a game in Java. Who uses Java anymore? Not a single mention of Python in these curricula, not at all. So uh, these students graduating from high school are now going into universities with an insufficient, uh, insufficient experience uh, to qualify them for the labor market. The hope, of course, is that they would get trained up and uh, they would learn the skills necessary. But the reality is that the way the funnel of the university works, uh, today, the talent gap uh, is about 571,000 roles annually that go unfulfilled. And that's growing 10 times that, so 6.2 million by 2030. It's getting worse, is the point. You're not going to be able to fill that with university graduates. So what are enterprises to do? They need to go somewhere. Right? They're interested in upskilling their existing talent or reskilling folks, moving them from one place to the other, because they're seeing that they have the executive buy-in. They have the CIOs that are saying, put AI here, like set up a pilot project there. Uh, but some enterprises that were surveyed are worried that they've been moving too quickly and they haven't had enough time to train up the AI talent necessary uh, to meet the demand, thus exacerbating this marketplace problem. So. How do we fix this? Well, let's think at an atomic level what specific skills are required. It is not rocket science. Uh, as I mentioned before, even a passing familiarity with MLOps uh, is going to put you leagues ahead of uh, any other person who has been at a company for five years, is pretty set with uh, how things should be done, uh, but uh, is unwilling or has not considered uh, introducing a more scaled approach uh, to uh, to deploying these models in production. Uh, the same could be said for perhaps at the company that you're currently at. Maybe uh, you've been set and doing something a certain way for a while, um, but you're finding that you're not able to meet customer expectations in production. Consider getting familiar with MLOps for this purpose. The basic MLOps workflow, of course, data cleaning, feature selection engineering, algorithm selection, training and tuning, model monitoring, and improvement cycles. Most of this not that difficult to understand. In fact, many tools automate a lot of this for you, like Google's AutoML, when it comes to algorithm selection, as an example. Uh, there are other tools, of course, like Hugging Face, which is a great model repository for NLP. Uh, Tecton, which I mentioned earlier, this is a feature store for 
being able to scalably uh, onboard, manage, and collaborate on the features that you use uh, for a company's uh, machine learning models uh, across the board. And then YLabs is a model monitoring uh, uh, component of the MLOps workflow as well. So all this, uh, all this is to say that uh, the tools are there today that you don't need to know how to do all of this from scratch. You can use them. It's not required, but you can. And of course, languages and libraries below. You, uh, you may find as you just get started that you don't need to know PyTorch or TensorFlow yet. And AutoML may take you quite a long way, especially if your enterprise is a little bit smaller. But it might be worth uh, investigating this to see, uh, to see how much more you're going to need to, uh, to learn, depending on the requirements that your organization will have. The point that I have in all of this is that this is not rocket science. To solve this marketplace problem, this is not rocket science. We, you do not need a four-year degree. They're not going to teach you ML ops within a four-year degree. And if it took them four years to teach you ML ops, then you're going to the wrong program. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, there, there's a link there on the slide uh, that introduces you to MLOps principles. Fourth Brain, I know, has a lot of great content on YouTube. I encourage all of you to get familiar with it. If you're even just thinking about taking a step on this journey, there's a ton of resources available that will make you more informed and perhaps even just make you a better asset uh, right off the bat to, uh, uh, to the rest of your organization. Uh, so uh, this is all to say that point number four, the AI ML talent gap is a solvable marketplace problem, so long as we look outside the university system in order to solve it. Which brings us to my last section, the fourth brain advantage to solving this marketplace problem. This is sort of the learner's perspective. Why would I, uh, I, I, I understand at this point that there's a huge talent gap, okay? There's probably a lot of competition for uh, those that are uh, skilled and qualified uh, for those roles. Uh, that could mean a very lucrative payday for me. But what, why would I you know, work with fourth brain as opposed to anything else um, to, in order to do this? Why wouldn't I go get a four-year degree from, uh, from somewhere else that is perhaps more credentialed uh, that, uh, that an employer would see and understand? Well, you might be surprised. Uh, fourth brain has a few advantages that I've listed here. Uh, they're not all listed, but these are the ones that I felt compelled to, to bring up. Uh, the first is that compared to, uh, compared to most online learning, most self-directed programs, um, which the team has a lot of experience in uh, just across the board at Udacity, uh, Trinity, 2U, and so on, uh, they've found that consistently group cohorts achieve considerably higher completion rates versus self-directed programs. Because you got a community, you got your friends, you got your peers, they're helping you out. Uh, you're all encouraging each other as you're learning. More learning is often done you know, in the hallway uh, than in the classroom, I've found. Uh, and that's not entirely unique, of course, to fourth brain, you know, there are other cohort based programs. Uh, but I will also add that, uh, that the fact that we compress this into a 10 week or 16 week uh, program, depending on the, uh, on the density of the content does make it much more efficient than advanced degrees uh, for accomplishing the same thing. So if you were looking to make an impact soon, I would recommend something that was a bit faster and more concentrated, which brings me to the next point. Uh, you could do all this in a vacuum. You could build your own projects and you could deploy your own stuff to GitHub uh, and think I made this shiny thing here. Uh, I think that's cool. Uh, what do employers think? Fourth Brain, fortunately, uh, has capstone projects that were developed in partnership with their employer partners like Samsung, Spotify, Cisco, and more. These are employers who have said, I have looked at the quality of Fourth Brain graduates that I've brought on, and these guys are great. I want more fourth brain students. Give me some of those. Here are some problems that we're facing today. Can you throw some of your students at that? And perhaps we get you know, some free work there, but then we also see uh, the high quality that you guys of, uh, uh, of graduates that you guys are able to uh, bring to the table that we may wanna hire ourselves. That's what that's for. You're not presenting to perspective, you're presenting to prospective employers. You're not just presenting to your peers, which is great and it's, it's encouraging, but it's much more helpful when you have that external feedback almost immediately. Uh, Fourth Brain also uniquely uh, does provide a wide array of career services. I'll let Greg and Matt uh, talk about that you know, another time, but the point here is that uh, they are much more uh, leaned in to, uh, to helping you succeed and to finding your next role uh, if that is what you, uh, what you choose to do. Uh, 
uh, or upgrading within your existing uh, within your existing company. Finally, and probably the most important takeaway uh, for uh, for you prospective learners out there is that truly uh, getting into machine learning is going to be a massive earnings boost uh, to to you today. Uh, fourth brain graduates have, and this is internal data, but on average have uh, received an approximately 34% increase in their compensation that we've seen. And that's, you know, a mix of, of international and U.S. national salaries. So we'd have to, uh, we have to excise that a little bit to see uh, what that looks like regionally, but that's at the average. Uh, within the United States, uh, the median base machine learning engineer salary is $140,000. $140,000 as of 2021. And this is from a survey that we had uh, conducted across about 5,000 uh, different roles and companies. Uh, and that's 190,000 at the average. So if you are at the top of your game, if you're a top performer, that is skewing way, way, way up. And this is a mixture, of course, of you know junior and uh, intermediate and senior roles. I would say that junior MLEs just getting started out would probably get paid about 120K. Uh, but uh, the point is that you have a long path ahead of you of massive earnings boosts by continuously investing in AI education for yourself and upgrading your own capabilities. You're committing to that. The last thing to add about all of this is this all sounds great, Ryan. Okay. But um, how do I trust that fourth brain or that employers are going to believe you on this? That fourth brain truly does. Uh, deliver the quality that you say it does? Well, we asked the question. And uh, what we found uh, was that fourth brain compared to any of the other uh, competitors that you might imagine, uh, actually has a perceived quality score of their graduates and of the program uh, at about the same, uh, a little under, but about the same uh, as Stanford's AI graduate certificate, which is what I'm currently taking right now. Uh, personally, I wish that Fourth Brain had existed earlier in my ML education career. Uh, I love how efficient it is and how concentrated uh, the materials are, and it would have made me a uh, very effective uh, AI product manager before I became an AI company builder. Uh, but uh, this is all to say that uh, despite Fourth Brain uh, not coming from, say, a accredited, so to speak, university background, uh, that the quality of their program uh, is on par with one of the best. So this brings me to my final point, which is that Fourth Brain ranks among the most efficient, highest quality resources for anyone looking to upgrade their AI ML skill set. If you're interested, if you have a passing interest perhaps in ML ops, Fourth Brain's got something for you. If you are a uh, senior engineering manager and you're beginning to uh, you're beginning to adopt more machine learning engineers on your team, and you want to learn how to structure your projects uh, in a way that, uh, that will scale very well into production once you launch those uh, machine learning models, MLOps will be a great program for you. If you are interested in breaking in as an MLE, there's an MLE program. And Fourth Brain is continuously adding more content all the time. Uh, they've started with the MLE uh, program and have expanded to MLOps and then recently released a shortened version of the MLOps program as well. So they're continuously putting out new content, uh, new curricula, and, uh, and continuously adding back to the value for their students. To wrap it all up, here are the five points. Learning is a lifelong commitment to upgrading yourself. This is my philosophy and I believe is the philosophy of many of you on the call today that learning is a lifelong commitment to upgrading yourself. Now, upgrading yourself and upgrading human capital more broadly is a foundational requirement for the adoption of AI. Only 10% of enterprises today have actually achieved finan positive financial ROI from their AI projects. And the biggest barrier to that is getting the human capital up to snuff to be able to manage those projects. The future of human capital, related of course, requires increasingly more people who can build, improve, and scale AI systems, increasingly more. There's more digitization, there's more automation, there's more uh, roboticization, and the talent gap is growing. So the same people who are qualified are increasingly sought after because there are more and more roles uh, that need those people working on those problems. So it very much becomes a seller's market for anybody who has those skills. 
the AI ML talent gap is a solvable mar marketplace problem. It is a solvable marketplace problem, despite the stakes, despite how large that gap seems to be, it is solvable, but we have to think outside the box. We have to think outside of the traditional four-year university program. And the final thing to add there is that if you are considering something that is not a traditional four-year university program, but you want to invest in yourself and do so rather quickly, Fourth Brain ranks amongst the uh, most efficient, highest quality resources for anybody looking to do so. For anybody looking to upgrade their AI ML skill set, Fourth Brain is a great place to be. Now, uh, I want to be mindful of time. That's all uh, the slides that I have, and I believe that we have enough time here for some open uh, Q&A, which I am happy to answer to the best of my abilities. So I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing my screen here. Ryan, thank you so much. This was uh, this was awesome. You know, I, I really, really enjoyed hearing about the AI funds take on human capital and and sort of the broad spectrum from K through 12, all the way to upskilling and reskilling. And I think you're really speaking to the need that most of the people who are considering programs that are cohort based courses to upskill they, they feel this underlying need in the market today. It was really great to see some of those numbers articulated. I want to I wanna go ahead and start with this idea that you brought up, which is, which is that, you know, hugging face models of today are even worlds better than a year ago. So we, we you know, we talk about models getting worse over time. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, likened to the way we need to retrain ourselves. When models seem to be getting this much better over time, these sort of pre-trained models, yet humans are going to still be essential to the business value equation. You know, like what should we be trying to learn exactly in AI and ML today to give us the most opportunity to hit these 17.2 open roles. Um, should we just be using this, the models on hugging face or, you know, what has changed since mm -hmm. you learned ML to today? This is uh, this is something that I think about a lot. And this is kind of a through line that I have with uh, broader investment themes around AI infrastructure. But when I was just getting started out, uh, machine learning models were predominantly uh, either supervised learning or basic uh, deep learning models, uh, which you could probably run on a local GPU. Uh, increasingly, the models have gotten bigger, and thus the training time uh, for those models has gotten, uh, has gotten larger as well. And of course, the compute requirements, electricity requirements, and so on. Sometimes these models get more efficient over time, but uh, as of late, that is not really the case. The proliferation of what uh, Stanford refers to as foundation models, especially within language, are these very, very large billions and billions and billions of, uh, of parameters of, of embeddings, language models that take forever to train with, by pointing an entire data center of GPUs uh, at this thing, because you're training it on, uh, on uh, massive, massive, massive amounts of, uh, uh, of text corpora. So... Nobody with a GPU at home is going to be able to train their own uh, competing language model with GPT-3, okay? It's just not realistic. But uh, it also, uh, at the same time, it's also the case that large organizations that have the resources to train and deploy those language models then put themselves in place as sort of a gatekeeper, if you will, uh, for access to, uh, uh, to the performance that those models can actually provide. Uh, so they sell access to it via API and they get, you know, a really good, uh, really good deal on it. Uh, I think GPT-3 was, uh, was licensed exclusively to Microsoft Azure, as a matter of fact. Uh, so that becomes one example of that. Instead, uh, what I've seen more and more people do, and this kind of reminds me of sort of like more guerrilla days on the internet, uh, are being able to find more clever ways to build language models uh, that can mimic the same level of performance by using far fewer resources. These large organizations that already own data centers aren't necessarily incentivized uh, to be more clever about how they actually apply it. 
you're not incentivized to build small models or use small data approaches, data centric approaches, like mm -hmm. Andrew Wing talks mm -hmm. about a lot. They're big data companies and they see problems that they use big data to solve. So the more that people can uh, try to be scrappy about uh, how they build more efficient models through model compression or quantization or, uh, or other means like that, uh, the more that they're going to find that they can actually, uh, uh, they can actually deploy uh, models specific to their use case better than uh, the large central foundation models would be able to uh, would be able to serve. So I would recommend for anybody who's trying to get into this uh, to start, of course, with the centralized learnings that you know AutoML can provide. But don't just think that the end state of this is going to be a bunch of very large central figures that have uh, the models that everybody uses and you just pay to play. Think about how you might be able to build something that uh, works very well for your custom uh, for your custom use case because uh, it very well may be the case that uh, that GPT three could write a very convincing email or perhaps a short story, but uh, it's going to do uh, uh, it may not apply as much to uh, a more custom use case uh, that has very specific needs that you as the owner for that would know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when we, when we are, you know, speaking to a lot of potential learners that maybe they've even been working as a data scientist for a few years and they're, they're feeling like, okay, I've been kind of in the notebook. I'm kind of trapped in the notebook a little bit. Um, yeah. And, um, and I'm not really like able to see the rest of my AWS ecosystem or my GCP ecosystem, you know, like you mentioned, you know, big models, you mentioned auto ML, there's this pull towards more modeling because the models are getting more complex, right? Mm -hmm. And they are also getting more automated. Like it's, it's, it's easier to do many, many different types of models very quickly. So mm -hmm. people I, I feel are often still compelled towards learning more modeling, more modeling, more modeling, more modeling. And it seems that, um, you know, the, the, is it true that like the companies, when they actually are creating value, what they're looking for in their hire, are they often looking for this more and more modeling or like, what are they looking for in their hires that you've seen? Um, you know, again, back to the 17.2 million, like, are they looking for more modeling? Are they looking for data centric approaches? Are they looking for software engineering chops? Like what, what is the one thing, if we're gonna upgrade myself this year that I should try to pick up and I should go Greg 2.0 this year is going to be Greg plus this skill. Um, the importance of data is what I would say. The importance of data in the MLOps framework. Uh, I think hiring managers and companies want people with data-centric AI methodologies, even if they don't actually realize that that's what they're asking for. Uh, there's the common assertion, uh, common assertion, and this mostly comes from academia, that you hold the data set constant and then you have to spend almost all of your time trying to think uh, what exact model should I be using? What is the exact right hyperparameters that we should use for this? Uh, and then you get some soda performance that's maybe a few bits uh, above, uh, above the next thing. That's a vestige from academia that doesn't work as well really in production. So the data-centric method, which I'm talking about for MLOps as well, uh, emphasizes using uh, a spending most of your time on cleaning the data and truly understanding uh, how that data is distributed and uh, whether you need to plug certain gaps or uh, find, new, uh, find new representations uh, that are, exist in production but don't exist in your uh, training set yet. So if you can come to the table and say, look, mo like any off the shelf model is probably gonna be just fine but uh, we're going to be really upgrading our performance uh, by spending most of our time on understanding the data. Mm -hmm. So in this case, imagine that, you know, pick whatever model uh, AutoML basically tells you to do. If it's a multi-layer perceptron, that's probably, that, you know, fine, sure. It's not gonna be like a super advanced transformer, uh, but it'll be something straightforward that could probably get the job done. But you will find more often than not that spending the majority of your time on cleaning the data and getting the right representation of the data and setting up the loop within the operations framework mm -hmm. uh, to continue introducing new uh, unmeasured 
uh, instances or distributions uh, as they come up, you will elevate the entire system far better than a single um, single really high performance, uh, really expensive model would be able to do. Okay. So don't just, uh, don't just say, I'm going to use the biggest, baddest model there is. Uh, not all of us have a data center available. Uh, right. Just think more holistically about uh, what's the minimum required thing that I can do here in order to get up to uh, my performance threshold and how can I use data to do that? Yeah. You know, in, in this thinking holistically piece, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the data analyst who's, who's sitting there and they're like, he's telling me to focus on the data. It's like, yeah. man, I've been focusing on the data for years here and I am stuck, right? I, I yeah. can't get a data scientist gig. I can't get an ML engineer gig. I can't get an ML ops gig. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough software engineering background. You know, I've been, I've been searching data for insights or researchers are the same way researchers and data analysts mm -hmm. and or product analysts. And, 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 you know, they'll sit there and they'll say, well, what does he mean? the data, like I'm spending yeah. time with the data. So can we square this with a, just a couple of things? This will be uh, what we sort of close up on here. So I want to, I want to tie a couple of threads together. We've got sure. focusing on the data, but it needs to be holistic. Um, we've got this idea that really the number one thing you can do is to build, improve and scale the AI system. Yeah. But you should focus on the data first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we've got this, uh, this great analogy that, uh, that I read recently in a paper that you co-authored with uh, some venture capitalists mm -hmm. that, you know, models of today, um, they're no longer your pets, you're no longer taking care of them and nurturing them every day. They're more like cattle. Yeah. Um, and so can, can, we, can we sort of tie this together, of, of focus on data, but do it holistically and, and really try to just leverage the best model off the shelf rather than doing your own custom model. Of course. And I'll try not to get too into the metaphor uh, that, yeah. that you had laid out, but it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I've actually, uh, I've raised, uh, my family and I have, have raised over 30 dogs growing up, over 30 dogs as pets, as well as a bunch of other, you know, ranch cats, et cetera. Uh, but this is all on a working cattle ranch. Uh, so I have more familiarity with both uh, raising pets and cattle at the same time, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, which is just serendipitous that the other co-author had used that uh, as an example. Uh, what, what's meant kind of by that and then laying it into the da data science um, uh, field here is that traditionally data scientists have been seen as kind of like staying within the Jupiter lab playground a little bit. Um, that's traditional, not, not a lot of the data scientists that I have worked with uh, at Uber or beyond, but uh, the traditional consideration was that they would stay sort of in their science playground, uh, working on their pets, really, you know, training them, um, tuning them, et cetera. Um, but uh, they would work really well for pet use cases, but not if you had to then deploy that into production, uh, because that has a whole lot of other scary implications with it. Raising cattle is very different than raising pets. Raising cattle, of course, you know, you're going to be feeding them, you're going to be watering them, uh, providing them plenty of space to roam but you need to do so in a systematic way uh, that enables the production of not just one or 10, but thousands of cattle simultaneously. So um, when I say you need to focus on the data, um, the data that you're bringing in from production, if you're a data analyst or you're, or you're a data scientist, uh, you need to basically cement yourself as a subject matter expert uh, for your field. If you are working as a uh, courier data scientist, uh, then uh, it's going to behoove you to be the person that everybody goes to uh, when it comes to any question under the sun uh, over what could be contributing to uh, to courier churn or to uh, or to courier utilization. Uh, so when I say data, I mean you need to turn yourself into a subject matter expert if you haven't done so already, uh, and then in, at simultaneously think about how to scale this outside of just the Jupyter Lab notebook. Uh, that you're working on. So begin, uh, uh, begin collaborating with some of the other members on your team. Is there a centralized feature store that you can use to start sharing these features with each other? Because perhaps they're using a lot of the same things. Uh, Tecton obviously uh, is you know, the product for that. Um, do you have uh, the ability yet to uh, start monitoring these things in production? Uh, these are some of the tools that we talked about earlier. So um, in my experience, 
data analysts who want to graduate to data scientists or data scientists who want to graduate to say senior or MLEs uh, have been working on one part of the MLOps framework up to this point, uh, but have little experience uh, with the other two. So um, my recommendation uh, would be after you have uh, cemented yourself as a subject matter expert on the data, uh, and you'll know when you have, uh, that uh, you should be heavily investing in the operationalization of, uh, of that knowledge. And just keep in mind that the work that you're going to be doing on the model is probably going to have uh, the, uh, the least amount of returns. Spend most of your time on the data and then a lot of your time on scaling. That is how you'll scale up. Mm. Oh, I love it. Okay, so subject matter expertise first operationalization second. And if you really want to get that multiplier effect, scaling, scaling mm -hmm. is where you're going to find it. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today, man. This brings us to the end of today's event. We hope that you've enjoyed your time with us and that you have some key insights about the AI funds perspective on human capital, on the future of AI and the workforce that is required to bring it to fruition, and that you're gonna share some of this new knowledge with your community. And hopefully it helps guide your own career a little bit as well. We're grateful at Fourth Brain to be able to showcase the AI Fund in this event and to showcase part of the larger ecosystem that our company is a part of. Upon graduation, if you take any of our programs, you will be part of the Fourth Brain and the AI Fund communities. Check out fourthbrain.ai for more information on our upcoming MLE or our MLOps course offerings. Our next 16-week MLE program launches August 9th. Our next 10-week MLOps program launches September 10th. And our brand new MLOps short course offering, which is great for budding potential AI product managers. Reach out to Ryan if you have questions about how to become one of those. Um, starts next week on July 5th. That's all for today. We look forward to bringing you more events soon to help you take your ML career to the next level. See you next time.